Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning on Labor Day weekend. And I can tell by how packed it is in here that uh, <laughs> actually it's not a bad crowd at all. But uh, can't blame people to be out in the last unofficial weekend of summer in this beautiful weather. I mean, I, I was camping and came back for this, so you're lucky I came. It was so nice there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, before we uh, start, we recognize that we're gathered to worship on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, today, devotionals are available at the doors. If you haven't picked one up already, please do. You're only a couple days late. You can catch up. Uh, please join us uh, today after worship for a fellowship time just at the uh, front doors there. There's coffee, tea, and sweets, and uh, everyone is welcome to stay for that. Uh, we also extend our blessings and prayers for all our students and teachers and educational sports staff as we know that they're heading back to school this week. So we pray for them and everybody who's going back to work um, this fall. Uh, Roy and Barry are going to be doing the greeting and counting this month and we thank them for that. And uh, as always, if you'd like to join our choir, just talk to Linda. She'd be happy to have you and uh, it's great to add more voices to the choir. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we will be having a session meeting uh, September 11th after church here in New London. And just a heads up, in October we're going to be starting our, or continuing our fall Bible study that was uh, looking at the Old Testament. So you can block those days off. They'll be Wednesday evenings or Thursday mornings at the Kensington Church. Any other announcements before we begin? All right, let us join together and sing in our introit sanctuary. Responsive call to worship. Joy comes to those who follow the ways of the Lord. We will follow the Lord with joyful hearts. Those who follow the Lord are like trees planted by the river, bearing fruit each season. May our lives be fruitful and blessed by God. Worship the Lord who leads us to joy and abundance. 
and let us worship as we sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. begin, and when the words turn white on the screen, you're invited to join. Let us pray. God of all creation, you have opened the world around us and filled it with creatures of your love and purpose. Each one declares your praise. The mountains state your majesty. The ripened fields express your generosity. Birds flying freely in the sky sing of your freedom. The tiny ant works with your persistence. And what do we and what do we declare about you in our lives? Lord, we pray that our work will honor your justice and mercy. May our relationships speak of your love and compassion. May we praise you, O God, not just in this hour of worship, but in all our waking and working. Challenge us today and every day to live out the praise we offer you through the grace of Jesus Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God of justice and mercy, we offer you our love and loyalty in worship, yet we admit we don't always live out that love and loyalty. We don't always act on our good intentions as we fail to keep our promises and we hurt each other. Worse still, we often refuse to seek or offer forgiveness. Lord, forgive our selfish and self-centered ways. Holy Spirit, guide us and lead us to live as our Savior calls us to live. All this we ask, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Friends, while it is true that we have sinned, that we have fallen short of God's hope for us, it's a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's amazing love. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Christ Jesus, our sin is forgiven. So be at peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. Amen. This morning we're going to sing as our worship song, Lord, I lift your name on high. and of wisdom, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit as we listen to your word, refresh our understanding, and equip us to respond to you in love for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The choir is now going to sing for us.
Our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 14, reading verses 25 through to 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and he said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to what I've been reading in the news this summer was one of, if not, the best in terms of tourism on PEI. Despite the high cost of fuel, despite the rising cost of living, people have come in droves to visit. And I'm sure this had everything to do with the fact that for the past couple of years, we've been limited in our ability to travel and people were desperate to get out, to see and to do things once again. And who can blame them? It's been wonderful being able to move about freely and to see friends, to see family that we've been apart from for so long. The great thing about the tourists and summer residents' return is that they've brought a good need and boost to our local economy. Stores, shops, campgrounds, restaurants, tourist attractions, hotel rentals, and other related businesses, maybe even the church, they've been hit hard during the pandemic. And they've been working feverishly to recoup some of what they've lost. However, the problem many of the businesses have had is their inability to hire staff to operate at full capacity. The result is that hotels and motels are having to turn customers away because they don't have the staff to clean rooms. Well, many restaurants have made the difficult decision to close a day or two a week so that their staff can get a break. Staffing shortages are affecting many businesses, many companies outside of the tourism industry as well. As we're all aware, the healthcare system is struggling to staff hospitals and clinics, as well as nursing homes and seniors care residences. The construction industry is desperate for more workers. The education system is seeking large numbers of substitute teachers, EAs and support staff. Retail stores, fast food restaurants, farms, trucking companies, and other businesses are also seeking employees to fill positions. There are so many job vacancies that when you go out, you're hard pressed not to see a job advertisement or help wanted sign. Not enough workers to fill the countless jobs implies it's an employee's market. Job seekers seemingly have their pick of work. This also means that they have the flexibility to negotiate favorable terms in their employment. With the seemingly endless opportunities and all the incentives and pay raises that are being offered in some fields, it's not surprising that people are seriously looking at changing careers or jobs and are picky when trying to find what they like, what pays well, or what job seems to suit their lifestyle. And I'd be the first one to encourage people to seek out a career or position that matches their gifts, matches their talents, and fulfills their interests. Over whether we're in our dream job, we're still searching, or we're going to school with a specific career in mind, we need to remember that life is more than earning a paycheck. We need to realize that we're not meant just to spend hours of our days solely focused on work, money, or other pursuits. There's more to life than obsessing about what we want to buy, what we want to have, or what we want to do with our earnings. Like we talked about last week, life is more than just gaining power, honor, and prestige. Interesting, life is even more than our family and friends. 
Therefore, if earthly gains, passions, and relationships take up all our time, they take up all our energy, then Jesus tells us our focus is on the wrong thing. In our reading today, Jesus challenges the crowd of listeners to focus on one thing and one thing alone. God. He calls on them and us to ignore those things around us, including our wants, including our desires, and other things that distract us. Instead, he calls on us to focus our attention on following him. For many of us who grew up in the church or who are, from, are familiar with the Bible, this may not be a new idea or a new command. Throughout the Gospels, in different stories, using different parables, we're taught the importance of putting God first and how everything else pales in comparison or of importance. But Jesus' words in this passage seem a little more blunt, disturbing, and even harsh compared to some of his other teachings on the same topic. For a man who talks about God's love and God's grace, his words in this passage don't sound all that loving or caring. Jesus begins, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Now these are some <laughs> strong words. I mean, we often teach children not to use the word hate. Instead, we might encourage them to say they dislike something or they don't care for it, especially when we're talking about foods they might avoid, like broccoli or lima beans. We definitely don't like to hear the use of the word hate when talking about other people, as this creates a variety of problems, a variety of attitudes, including racist ideologies, xenophobia, and even feelings of superiority. But despite these troublesome issues, here we have Jesus, the Son of God, telling the crowd that to be one of his disciples, we must hate others. As weird as this sounds, we might be willing to hate others if Jesus was referring to our enemies. That would be easy. But instead, Jesus specifically lists our parents, our immediate family, even our own lives. What's going on here? This doesn't sound like a teaching from our Savior. It seems to go against everything that Jesus taught us, especially considering in another passage, he tells us the two most important commandments are to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. The thing is, Jesus isn't speaking literally in our text today. Instead, he's, he's using the word hate as an overstatement, as an embellishment. As we've seen in some of his other teachings, Jesus is exaggerating to make his point. Therefore, when he talks about hating our closest family and even our own lives, he's emphasizing the fact that there's something greater, something more important than our perceived priorities. Therefore, Jesus is saying that we can't or shouldn't allow something that's less valuable in our lives displace something more valuable. This makes sense. It's only natural that we should place more emphasis on some aspects of our lives. We know that there are things more important than others. Deep down, we know wealth and possessions shouldn't be our focus. For instance, family and friendships should come first. But shockingly, Jesus tells us there's something even more important than family. There's something more valuable that should take precedent in our lives. Him. And he's challenging his listeners and us to embrace our commitment and allegiance to him and him alone. He emphasizes this point saying, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Therefore, when Jesus says to hate father and mother, wife and children, etc., he's not being literal. He's not saying that we should despise our family. Instead, he's calling on us to recognize that following him is the most important thing that we can do. But he also tells us that it's not something we can jump into half-heartedly. Being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus, isn't a decision that we should just take lightly, because it will cost us everything. And he uses two examples to prove this point. 
The first is about building a tower and the need to first sit down and to calculate, to make measurements, to add up the costs of construction before you ever put a shovel in the ground. And in the second example, he refers to a king and how before waging war, it's the right thing to sit down, to plan, to strategize, and to determine the feasibility of battle knowing you're outnumbered by the enemy. In both these illustrations, Jesus points out that careful deliberation, planning, and thought is essential. Otherwise, the outcome may not be as we expect. And in the same way, Jesus challenges us to sit down and reflect on what it means to be a disciple. Don't get me wrong, in no way is Jesus trying to talk us out of following him. He's not trying to convince us that the task is too difficult and that we should avoid it at all costs. He's not trying to scare us. At the same time, he doesn't want us rushing in, ill-prepared, or without an understanding of what we're getting ourselves into. Instead, he's letting us know that it won't always be easy and that we're going to have to make sacrifices. He warns us that we won't always know what's ahead, but we must understand that discipleship is a commitment. Discipleship isn't just a hobby or a pastime. It isn't something meant to be done only in our spare time or when it's convenient. It isn't something that we push to the back burner when life gets busy or something else comes up. In our scripture reading today, Jesus tells us point blank that discipleship is to be our number one priority and that living for him comes above everything else. However, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that life is, as a disciple is easy. Nor am I going to tell you that I've got it all figured out or that I always have my priorities straight. Wouldn't it be great if I did? Like most of us, I can get sidetracked. I can get caught up in my own desires and wants. I can get caught up in family affairs and dealing with issues and trying to solve problems. I can fall into the many different temptations of this life, including material gains and lose focus of where Christ is calling me. Therefore, whether we're in school, whether we're in our dream jobs, still going from one job to the next trying to figure things out, or we're retired and pursuing other interests, we all share something in common. School, work, hobbies, extracurricular activities, and other interests take up a lot of our time and energy. Beyond that, our obsession with money and finances, material wants or desires can consume us. Even more, looking out for our family and loved ones and friends and neighbors can take up much of our thoughts, energy, and time. Without a doubt, some of these commitments and aspects of our lives are important to our health and to our well-being. We need love, we need friendships, we need hobbies, we need interests. Likewise, it's responsible for us to work and to be educated and to look after our finances, to plan for the future. However, we must take conscious effort not to prioritize these aspects of our lives over our relationship and our commitment to Christ. Because we're called to put God first. Therefore, I encourage you to take time to sit down and consider what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Spirit willing, I pray that you dedicate or rededicate yourselves to being Christ's disciples in this world. Like I said, this can be difficult, but Jesus promises that ultimately this is our calling and it is worth it. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, in our world there are so many things that distract us, whether it's family, our job, school, or our involvement in hobbies, service, or social groups, or community organizations. Our relationships are important to us. And much of the time and energy we put into other activities are also important to us and others. However, we recognize that they can also distract us and pull us away from you. Savior, help us to make you our priority as we seek to live as your disciples. Remind us that it's only through you that all things are possible and that we receive salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few things to think about this week. What are my priorities in life? And what changes do I have to make to bring Jesus and discipleship to the forefront?
Our mission moment this morning is looking at a mission taking place in Malawi. Vania is 15 years old and lives in Malawi with her parents and four siblings. When Vania finished primary school, she wrote an entrance exam for secondary school and was selected to attend the Neno Girls School, supported by the Presbyterian Church in Canada through Presbyterian World Service and Development. Sadly, Vania's parents couldn't afford the school fees and she was forced, forced to withdraw. But PWSD recognizes the importance of education for young girls to achieve their dreams and gain self confidence. PWSD provides scholarships for orphans and vulnerable girls in Malawi to attend the Neno Girls School who otherwise could not afford to due to financial constraints. And Vania was one of the students selected for this scholarship and is now completing her high school education. May we keep this mission and others in our prayers. On the Labor Day weekend, we offer to God the fruit of our labor to support in the redeeming work that God has begun in our world. Friends, today, given hope and in trust that God will accomplish more than we could ever ask, more than we could ever imagine through the gifts that we give, the offering will now be received. Let us pray. O oh God, we come and we offer our gifts to you. Gifts of money, gifts of our time, of prayer, of service. Lord, we ask that you bless them and use them to heal and reshape the world that you love with the good news that we celebrate in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us join together in singing the hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. before God and we pray for the world and God's people and during the prayer I'll say God in your mercy and 
invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Out of all times and of all people on this Labor Day weekend, we thank you for all the skills and talents with which you bless your people. Thank you for what we have accomplished through the work we do and for what each one of us contributes to the well-being of our community. Lord, inspire us to work together on the challenges we face and surprise us with the solutions to problems that once seemed overwhelming. God, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray for all those who labor in difficult situations. We pray for children who work in terrible conditions and are paid very little. We pray for migrant workers who live far from their families and work hard in fields, in processing plants, and other industries as they earn money to send home to their loved ones. We pray for all those who are underpaid or unjustly treated in their workplace, those who work in unbearable or unsafe conditions. God, in your mercy, Hear our Lord, we pray for those who cannot labor, for those who are unemployed or underemployed, for those who have become injured on the job or too sick to keep working, for those who are denied the opportunity to earn a living because of war or discrimination. God, in your mercy, we pray for those who labor in our community, for those who must work today and tomorrow instead of enjoying the long weekend, for those who are overworked and feeling the stresses and strains, for those who must work several jobs in order to take care of their families. We lift up those who work at jobs we wouldn't do ourselves because they're messy or unpleasant. We pray for those working to help others, for those who give them themselves in serving their neighbors and strangers. God, in your mercy. On this Labor Day weekend, we offer gratitude for laws that protect children, for health and safety practices that prevent tragedies in the workplace, and for generations before us who advocated for vulnerable employees, for fair wages and equal opportunities. God, in your mercy. In healing God, we pray for all those who are sick and ailing. We pray for those in hospital and those who are at home recovering. We give you thanks for successful surgeries, procedures and treatments. We pray for healing of body, mind and soul. We pray for those who are anxious or worried about what lies ahead, for those who experience chronic pain and suffering. We lift up those who give their energy and time and care for those who can't look after themselves. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of someone or something dear. May they experience your comfort and hope. God, in your mercy. And ever-present God, we lift up to you all those going back to work and school this coming week. We pray for all our students, whether in grade school or post-secondary, that they'd have a successful year of learning. We pray for our teachers and educational staff as they head back for another year. We pray for those returning to their jobs after holidays. We pray for our farmers as they harvest their crops and for the fishers as they bring in their catches. Lord, we thank you for the busy tourist season this summer, and we pray for all the business owners. God, in your mercy. The Savior, in the silence, we lift up to you people and places that are on our minds this day. All these prayers we lift up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, in your mercy. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer.
Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another. Go with courage and faith, knowing that you are not alone. For you go with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.